nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So how, how can NanoHub be useful for research? How can it have impact? Um, let me pull up a, a, a sort of personalized example. In, uh, in May of 2006, we deployed a code called NanoWire. And uh, you sort of see a usage statistic up to a year later in June of 2007, where the number of uh, aggregate simulation users have increased significantly and some 9,000 simulation have been run by some 600 users. And so let me personalize that a little bit by looking at a student, Somitra Merotra. He is at, uh, was at the University of Cincinnati at the time. And uh, I didn't know the person, right? He was just a person on NanoHub. And I later asked him whether I can have a picture of him. So in this time frame from October, uh, August 06 to April 07, he used some 26 tools, ran some 3,000 simulations. And uh, in particular, he looked at Band Structure Lab and FedToy, but really he looked at NanoWire. He ran some 2,800 simulations on NanoWire. And you can see here the simulation number of simulations that he ran in these months. And we can also look at the CPU time that he's utilizing, and those are not exactly the same plots. So he was getting more sophisticated in this usage, right? He ran less, but the tool ran longer. So he was uh, exploring more sophisticated uh, models in this tool. But he did more than just uh, looking at uh, tools. He spent about 52 hours uh, on 134 items on the NanoHub. He's really educating himself on how to use these tools and how to learn about the theory. And uh, he filed some 96 support tickets. Um, many of them were filed automatically when a tool died. So we had to deal with him from that end as we were deploying the system at the time. And then come April, it quieted around him a lot because uh, he had something really exciting. He went to his first IEEE conference and he gave a uh, presentation on process variation study for silicon nanowire transistors. That's why he was running so many simulations. He did a process variation study. And so he presents this tool. These are NanoHub images right here. He acknowledges that this tool came from NanoHub. And he puts uh, reasonable results in his paper. And really the paper is how we found out about him in a sense, right? Um, we, uh, he wrote this paper in an IEEE journal. And at the bottom, uh, he does a citation. I know you can't read this, so I'm going to blow this up for you. Simulations were performed on nanohub.org. And above and below, he also cites the papers that ultimately created this tool. So the point is, the authors of this tool also get benefits, right? They get more citations, because this would have been, in principle, a dead PhD thesis, right? Nobody would have been able to use this nanowire tool if it hadn't been on NanoHub and it was generating new science by people that we didn't even know. And in his group at the University of Cincinnati, his advisor, Ken Runker, had something nice to say that he uses it a lot in his group and it resulted in conference presentations. Um, and he, he's been using, or in his group, NanoWire, FedToy, MOSFET, and CNT bands. And he's not alone. There's some, uh, some 600 users, uh, 500 users, 600 users, and 500, 600 users at the time. So two years back, these tools have been quite heavily used. And here's an example of a person sort of testifying to its use in research. Uh, here's an, a testimony of an experimentalist that used a tool called CNT bands that we thought originally could be only an educational tool because you visualize carbon nanotubes and look at the dispersions and you look at the density of states. But there's an experimentalist that actually used it to sort out his experimental data. Things we didn't expect, but they happen. 
So an experimentalist using the tools. And then we see something else that is interesting. So Ashraf Alam is a Purdue faculty that, whose expertise is in reliability. And he puts his um, uh, lectures, the essence of what you need to know about reliability, he put that on the NanoHub. And that is now being cited in research publications. Okay? People go to the NanoHub and learn about reliability and look through the lectures and then they cite it in their paper. We have changed modes of publication. It's not necessarily peer review, but we have changed how we are publishing papers. Um, these are not the only citations, so there's some 430 citations in the scientific literature now, and they're growing nicely. And we distinguish whether they're inside or outside of the NCN. And another way to look at that is we have sort of a cosmos of, of uh, citations now, right? So you can look at this cosmos, and each dot is a paper. And then you can ask, well, yeah, you guys have a lot of money. It's probably all the people that you gave the money to that cited, right? Not quite. Uh, so here this cosmos is now colored by um, the red dots are people inside of the NCN, the green dots are people, are papers that come from authors outside of the NCN. And there's about 52% of these uh, papers come from outside of the NCN, which, which is good, right? And this is a, a pretty strict requirement. If you're at Purdue or inside the uh, University of NCN, and if, if I ever talk to you, even if I never gave you funding to do your work, you're part of NCN because you got some sort of support. So the green dots are really people I quote unquote don't know. They come to NanoHub and use it. Uh, you can now ask uh, with whom are these people working and you can draw a line between these papers and a line would mean a common author. Meaning a person, I mean, uh, I mean even if you were alone and you wrote two papers uh, we would draw it like this way. There's a line between two dots. But what we really need to see is that this network for computational nanotechnology is heavily networked on the inside. But what's also cool is that there's really networks developing outside of the NCN, where people are working together and publishing together. And there's clusters that are connected to the NCN, to the top right, or there's islands of, of publications that are completely disconnected and, and there's clusters of papers that are connected to each other. Then you can argue, well, what are these people doing? Well, about 80% of these papers deal with nanoscience of some flavor or another. The interesting part is there's now 9% of papers that start to explain how you use NanoHub for education. So there's researchers writing papers on how to use NanoHub for education. And then some 16% deal with the cyber infrastructure aspect of NanoHub. And there's a whole lot of papers that are outside of the NCN that are looking inside of the NCN on how to develop an, uh, cyber infrastructure, which is kind of cool. We can home this in further to say, um, well, what are these papers citing? So in each of these papers we figure out what are they citing. So here's a nice network that deals with these 92 sh citations that cite SHRED, this tool that does Poisson Schrodinger. And there's a really nice network developing outside of the NCN, as you can see. And this is a tool that was created originally by Dragica Vasileska at Arizona State. And uh, we can Look how this tool is being used at many places. <coughs> Excuse me. In Florida, Berkeley, MIT, Vienna, uh, Purdue. And what we also what we plot here is the papers as they show up. Uh, so we have these lines here where uh, papers show up in in print, and then we have spikes of activity before these papers are written. So we can sort of say these people are using NanoHub for their research and outcomes are the papers. As I mentioned, this tool comes from Dragica Vasileska. What we offer now for every author is not only that their tools are getting cited, but we also give them graphs and statistics on how many people are using 
this author's tools. So it's like an incentive program in a sense, right? So her shred tool and other tools that she has online have been used on average now by two or three hundred users each month. And if you look at the integral number of different users, it's, about, it's approaching 6,000. So I like to compare that to citations and impact that you normally do in research. So if you're a member of the Academy of Sciences in the United States, you probably have about an, an H index of 40 to 45. To put that in perspective, if you don't know what an H index is, that means they have 45 papers that have been cited at least 45 times. That's this H index. I mean, chances are they wrote 200 papers. But out of those 200, there's 45 that have been cited at least by 45 people. That's like you're the cream of the cream of academics, right? So each paper that you're really proud about has been cited 45 times. Compare that to being used by 6,000 people. I know this is a different metric, but it's a metric to consider on how you actually impact research. On average, your papers that you work on as PhD students are going to have a citation ranking of three. That means three people in the world decide that the thing you busted your behind for several years is worthwhile citing in a paper. Okay? That's a perspective to have. So putting your PhD output in terms of tools and seminars onto NanoHub gives you a broader reach. So clearly NanoHub is being used uh, for research and we have really a social infrastructure that is starting to develop that is manif uh, manifesting itself in, in citations. Okay. With that, I'll take questions you might have. No questions? It's crystal clear? Yeah. There, there are some, uh, at least 400 citations, and I believe some of them are experimentalist, which would like to validate your models. Mm -hmm. And I really would like to know how they feel. Is there any negative, you know, tone on, on, on their... I like to know, too. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, uh, how, do, how strong can we make the evidence that experimentalists use this successfully? Yeah. So that's a question we, we got also this summer in our site visit. So now what we're doing next is go back to analyze these papers, figure out which papers are actually statistic, experimental paper, papers, and then seek a communications person on this problem and trying to interview what these experimentalists feel Right. So, I mean, that's the only way to, to really find out scientifically what, what was working, what was not working. Did you come back? Well, we, we would know if they came back, but why didn't you come back, right? I mean, that's, I, I, that's all still work in progress. I mean, I, we're just scratching the surface in, in that sense. It's a very good, it's an important question, certainly. Okay.